When did you start composing and what or who were your early passions and influences? Um, I started very young, like at 10 years or something, when I had my first um, mini keyboard with like, I don't know, 24 keys or something. And um, yeah, my main influences were just the, the music that was around um, at my parents' house, which was mostly the radio and the Beatles. And, um, and uh, I had uh, just been to my first Mike Oldfield concert, which was really influential on me being interested in trying to figure out what music is and how it works. And so, yeah, I started, I would say I started composing then and um, just kind of like trying out how things sound and how one can compose with pitches on the, on the keyboard. Before you can become original yourself, mostly you start out emulating others. What was that like for you? Um, I, I can't really tell. Um, it, I guess emulating wasn't really something that I was ever so much interested in, but just starting out trying to, trying to see what, um, what one can do with those few keys on the keyboard. Um, um, obviously there were things that I, I, thought it, I thought sounded cool, and I'm sure those were sounds that I had heard somewhere. Even, but I cannot really, I don't really know what those were. I also kind of, I did like some, even some Latin kind of music back then, like Bossa Nova and, and, uh, and you know, like the use of like chromatic tones in, in, um, in like more popular tunes. And, and so, yeah, I guess that's kind of what I was emulating. But I also liked, liked tracks like, uh, songs like um, Hotel California, for example. Um, I can't remember ever playing that melody on that keyboard, but that was uh, also an influence. So this usual path of where you search for your own voice for a very long time, that's not exactly how it went with you, right? So you basically had a, your own way of doing things right from the beginning? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't call it voice because I, I guess the voice kind of is something that develops over time. Um, but the, um, yeah, I, I just had this, this idea of, um, of kind of like, I guess, being more of a researcher and, and that has always stayed with me. And that was there from the very beginning. When you started out, what were some of the most important creative challenges for you? Um, I mean, just, just physically, uh, playing didn't come to me um, naturally. So um, even until my early 20s, I haven't, I didn't really, I wasn't really able to play well. So that was the kind of like the challenge I would say mentally and just in terms of my motivation, I was always kind of 100% there, I'd say. But just, just the, the physical aspect of making music, that was, that was and still remains to be the biggest challenge for me. And that, how did that, um, was there a moment where you had the impression that it, that it had sort of experienced a breakthrough or something? Um, well, just the fact that um, I, I, I actually started practicing a musical instrument when I was around 20. Um, that was the time when, when I realized, um, yeah, practice actually helps and it, it does something, like it, it changes you uh, from, the, from the inside out and um, helps you strengthen um, or help me strengthen my personality and also my um, yeah, my personality, but, but also like the personal, the personal tools that I have, that I have uh, in order to, to operate in this world. And obviously like making music or composing and this is kind of part of that, that development or, was an, or still is maybe the most important uh, element of my, uh, my life really. And the technical aspect of it, because that obviously plays an important role, especially in your early music, did was that ever a challenge, or is that something that simply was much less than the craftsmanship? Um, I don't think I understand the question. I mean, simply the, the, these like things like production, recording, mm -hmm. the editing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this uh, this was something I, I really only started um, to being interested in. Um, I guess in my late twenties. So. Um, for 
quite some time I completely neglected that part. But I guess that's also like historically uh, uh, correct in the sense that um, affordable recording technology really only happened to become available in the late 90s, early 2000s. And, and that's when I started. I, I, I still remember that I got the very first version of Ableton Live. Um, I didn't work with that much and then when Ableton 2 came out, I think, or just before Ableton 2 came out, I started, I started um, wanting to learn that piece of software and, and that was kind of the start of, of um, kind of also producing my own music. Before that I, was, I had a, dead, a small dead machine and was recording um, you know, myself and performances on, on two, two track stereo and I had some experience like, um, doing some editing with uh, a program called Cool, cool Edit Pro. Um, yeah, those were the days. <laughs> we're in your apartment at the moment. Is this the place also where you actually work on music? Yes. I mean, I, I, I'm a friend of a, of a mobile setup. So I, I have everything on my laptop, everything I need. Um, and I have a portable audio interface. Yeah, and I, I work um, like I don't want to say all the time, but really, um, I just want, want my tools to be available at all times. So, yes, a lot of a lot of the music that I did in the last five years was was created here, actually, I created here. So I do record here, but also composed here. Yeah. But, but uh, to be honest, for me, it doesn't really. Um, and this is something that uh, people hardly understand. For me, I I have. I feel like I'm so connected um, to music, or to even even just even just the, the nowadays just the physical act of creating sound. Um, you know, that could be just playing an instrument, or actually like typing on on the computer little keyboard, <laughs> or, or you know, it's um, it doesn't really matter to me where I am. I don't, it doesn't matter what time it is. Um, it doesn't matter if it's hot or cold outside. It's just, just the mu music just comes out no matter what. I think we just talked prior to the interview, we had, um, we had dinner and we talked about very briefly the interview and um, the recording session you had uh, last week at a really beautiful place called Casa Murada. But like if you have, if you're working in a space like that, it's, isn't the music going to be different than if you're recording it, for example, in, in a place like this, where it's smaller, more intimate? Yeah, I mean, I guess the difference—the difference is just the, um, um, the the time, the time restraints, I would say, and the, and the people that are around, or just the, the musical setting, you could say. That's what plays a bigger role. Obviously, in a big studio, in a nice studio, uh, there's plenty of space. There can be um, like several people playing together at the same time. It's something that, that really uh, obviously is different. But I still feel that I could do exactly the same here. And I don't, I don't know why that is, but I could, I mean, and just talking about myself, yes, obviously I couldn't have eight people recording uh, in this little room here, but I would still be able to play the same thing. And this, this is something that's astonishing me to, to me as well. And um, like one of the experiments I did in 2014 when I was uh, on tour with the Crimson Project and I record every night I played, I was the opening act and I played 10 minutes of solo, of a solo, little solo composition. And um, I still remember most of the shows, the stages, um, the vibe, um, you know, some shows were uh, in, in early spring, some were in, in high summer and um, so there were quite a few different settings, but when I listen back to the music now, I really cannot, I have to say, I don't hear any of those influences in the music. It's like I dive into, I go into this uh, state of trance when I perform and compose, and I just completely disconnect from, from the circumstances. I mean, that's what it feels like to me. And you know, just because I don't, I can't hear these influences in the music doesn't mean they are not there. Um, and I, I, I tend to believe that there is some sort of um, influence uh, that the audience has, like the, uh, like the, um, the engagement of the audience, if that's like in a, a goodwill or, you know, um, 
skeptical or whatever. I think that this, this, this kind of uh, attitude from the audience actually will find itself in the music much more than the actual setting. So. In terms of the creative process, does it also mean that you do not have a fixed schedule in terms of music making, that you could be working in the middle of the night, in the morning, or is there sort of a routine you like to stick to? Uh, no routine at all. And that's that's really something that people um, like the, the the public, just the few fans I have, don't really understand when they say you know that Marcus doesn't sleep. No, it's quite the opposite. I mean, I have, I actually work uh, in a very concentrated way when I actually work. So that maybe if I'm recording an album that's an hour long, I maybe not do anything for six months and then I sit down, I set up. I play the album and it's done. So it's you know not no more than two hours of effort to actually um, create the actual piece. But the the uh, the process the process is always like it's always uh, the 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 cogs are always turning in my head. Yeah, I guess. Um, but then I only let these things out occasionally. And I can be extremely productive in a very short, of, a short period of time. Are you thinking about music all the time? No, no, no. I wouldn't say so. Not, not anymore. That was maybe a long time ago. But um, it's become like the music making has become something that has become me. Um, so. It's, it's almost like a, dom a domino effect kind of thing. I've, I've started that at some point and now the, the dominoes, they keep keep tumbling, you know? And, and that's really, um, I don't need to think about making music anymore. So when we speak about this ideal creative state, which has sometimes been described as a flow state, mm -hmm. <clears throat> is that so that is something you, you're basically living in constantly at the moment. So it's like a period where you could be creating whenever you like, the, there's the moment is there and you know it's there and then you just start making. It's, it's like, yeah, it's like I, I can flick the switch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, I agree that maybe you're right and I'm in constantly in that state. That's, that's probably true. And it's just the, it's just the, um, The, the question really is, do I, do I document the process or do I not document the process? And the, like the, so if I decide to record something, that is maybe just the documentation of what's going on anyway. Uh, just the decision to pick up the instrument, to practice or pick, to pick up the instrument and uh, play a piece of music. That's really uh, that what makes the difference. And, and all, this, all this happens in a, in a state of flow, you could say. I think so. Maybe to just to go into a little bit of more detail, um, you just recorded a string quartet, your first string quartet. Um, can you maybe talk a bit about the process, how that happened the, from the beginning when there was just maybe an idea or maybe the, the idea of an idea until the moment you started writing and then realizing the, the, the piece in, in the moment of recording it? Yeah. I mean, to be quite honest, I don't really understand how these things come about. Um, obviously, it was you um, and your brother Dirk who uh, who kind of initiated this idea to to have a, make a recording project together, and um, where you where you said, Marcus, it would be great if you would compose for such and such ensemble, and and then in the end, we we, we arrived at the idea to uh, you arrived at the idea with the string quartet. And for me, that's obviously like a, it's a wonderful thing. Um, I never had thought about doing something like that before. Um, you mentioned it really, um, and yeah. So the, again, like once we started talking about that, that's when the process uh, really started for me, and uh, it was just a matter of kind of accepting that I had to do it. And uh, yeah, and at some at some point. Um, I mean, I, I knew that I, I, I was gonna t going to take six weeks off in the summer of 2018 to, um, to write the piece, but obviously before, before that I started um, to research 
music and now with um, the tool uh, called YouTube the internet or I did some research and um, and it's kind of it's it's funny because like one of the things that motivates me most is um, is is to is to is to hear something that is new to me but new not in the sense of necessarily I don't I said that in some other interview it's like it's not about that it's new it could just say something that excites me yeah and and so um, during the research period it was kind of interesting to see that there wasn't that much music that that was really exciting to me and it was not not the fault or you know the music wasn't wasn't bad or anything but I just realized that this this uh, standard way of of uh, still having having the elements uh, you know like rhythm you know melody harmony um, represented in such obvious ways um, even in in very contemporary music um, that was kind of you know I wanted to just to go beyond that and I think I did go beyond that and then ended up with something that can clearly be, you know, obviously just be categorized into those three elements. Uh, again, and there's no, you know, there's no doubt about that. Like it's some sort of um, um, principle, like like a, like a gestalt that you know, like we always hear, you know, pitches and rhythms in relate in relation with each other, and and so that's kind of unavoidable. So, but anyway, like my my idea was to to, to kind of put everything into a blender, and um, and that was that was you know in parallel to researching other composers, uh, string quartets. I had already started to um, to look for material for um, musical material I wanted to use for the pieces, um, and that was I have to say that that was quite a long process, uh, maybe. Um, maybe two, three years even, like from when I first started talking about uh, with my friend Hacksaw from, from Boston, he was a, compo um, was a musician, a drummer himself, but he's, he's a programmer and um, he helped me write this little piece of software, which is like initially really just maybe 20 lines of code. It's really, really simple. Um, and he helped me write this in Python so that I could run it on my, on my computer now and um, I started kind of listening to its output and sometimes um, these these sequences that were put out are kind of endless so you can just press play and listen for hours and I had to kind of really listen deeply and also for extended periods to this material to get a sense of which which of those um, starting points I wanted to use for pieces string quartet and so I mean the overall it was quite a quite a long process and then like um, the writing itself like where things were put into a form that came together very quickly it, it really just took those six weeks plus an extra let's say maybe four weeks of uh, refinement and and so yeah it was like between um, June and, and September um, the piece was the pieces were written Maybe just to clarify, when you say that it has to be new to you, it essentially means that you want to be surprised by something that you actually wrote yourself. So it's sort of, um, there's always sort of a, a fine line that, that you could actually dislike what you wrote yourself, right? So that's something that you create that is, feels as though it's outside, yeah, it's, almost outside of yourself. Exactly, it's not, it's not about like or dislike, it's, it's more about the... Um, if, if something is interesting to me, it's, it's, I know it's not very well defined what, what interesting means, but um, I guess, I guess it's just, I mean, this, this is really, really what, what, I don't know, but it's not the same for everyone, but for me, that's what makes, makes the art, art part, or that's why I, I I could call myself an artist as a musician or composer is that I 
do actually have an opinion about what I what I want to discover. If you like. so, so in a way, it's like, and this is something that I've written in the uh, in the liner notes uh, for Heartland is like the uh, I I really believe that the music is already there, and that it's just that it's just uh, this. In a way, it's a discovery process where you're actually discovering something that doesn't need to be discovered because it's it's hiding in plain sight. So maybe there's just like a veil uh, draped on it, and you got have to have to remove the veil, but it's already there. And this is kind of what how I see my work. I think the interesting thing is also that you have I think very emotional response to music, and you do not like. I think you said um, you have to listen with an open heart mm -hmm. and on the other hand I think you also told me that um, in a way if you have the score the, sc the score itself could be interesting enough to just read the score and you wouldn't even have to listen to the music for it to be interesting in a way right is that um, for certain for certain music that's uh, certainly true yeah like Johann Sebastian Bach's music which I think just just from an analytical standpoint, um, if you if you know how to read music, you can sit down and just enjoy it. With with my music, it's completely different. Like my music is is I think it's impossible to read read a score and have any idea what it sounds like. Um, but that's just because it's it's kind of like it's. Just what I said before, right? Like to put things in a in a blender and then um, you know completely destroy the fabric in a way, and then um, I put everything back together from the smallest pieces and it just creates a sort of a new fabric. Um, and in the in the case of, of of this particular project, like working with other musicians playing the music or the Matangi Quartet, beautifully uh, beautifully put together. Um, the atoms uh, back to become a fabric, really, and um, yeah, and that that was that was just a really really wonderful process to see how that actually worked out. So software played an important role in the composition process, or let's say it played um, a role in the composition. It's process. I mean to be to be quite honest, uh, yes, but it's not something you couldn't do by hand. Mm. It's, it just would be a lot of work, but it's, it's quite possible to do that by hand. It's just kind of a set of, uh, um, a fixed set of rules how to come up with a, a series of intervals. And that's, uh, it's, it can, could easily be done by hand also. So that's why I don't want to focus so much on the software part, because it doesn't really add anything uh, other than speed to the process. And in general, technology, what role does it play for you, for your music? Is it just, is it just a help, or is it uh, like a crutch, or is it um, like a sort of a creative source of um, inspiration as well? Yeah, I think it's just, just, just part of part of the toolbox. Like it, just as much as um, you know, I could be, I could be doing some ear training to to become a better listener, let's say, or to. To be able to distinguish to, between pitches better, I can um, I can use editing software to splice uh, two recordings together. I can you know I can practice my guitar to be able to play a C major scale. Um, I can practice to play a polyrhythm. I can um, learn to smile while I'm standing on stage. Uh, like all these little things, um, and the, the like the technology. In the broader sense, is just part of that. It can be can be used and applied and utilized um, in any in any creative process, uh, which one could also simply call life. So, so it's it's not really. I, and I mean, like looking at it from that perspective, I would say it's not it's not very important. It's it's just that I consider when I'm when I'm playing an electric guitar and I plug that guitar into an amp, then the amp is part of the guitar. Just like uh, an effects pedal or a laptop uh, is becomes part of the guitar, in and in the sense like it becomes part of me. So. So it's like it's like a, it's like a chain of. Of uh, elements that somehow touch each other. 
and in a way the output like the recorded music or in live performance the, you know the the vibrations uh, the the waves travel to the uh, eardrums of others and then so it's just like a constant propagation of of an action or of, of yeah so and technology is just one part of that now, for the string quartet and also for Todd Morton, I think those were compositions where you, um, what, well, it was important for you to actually write these on your own and not collaborate. Um, there's lots of other projects which you've done over the years where collaboration plays a very important role. What, um, what does collaboration give you? Um, what you, for example, or maybe what, on the other hand, does working alone give you? I mean, there, there are, like, I think, two two uh, different aspects like one is that obviously I really believe that um, each of us is an expert for something and um, so just working with with somebody um, just means that there's a different perspective there's there's an extra um, pair of ears there's an extra opinion there is it's just two of everything and that ideally becomes, or it just, it then becomes one if, if you uh, create something together. Um, so I, I think, I, th I think that, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting. Like, I've always found that collaboration does also sub subtract, you know, it's not that, that one plus one is two, but one plus one can be, one point uh, or zero point five, sometimes. Yeah, actually, actually, in quite a few instances, it's it's like you're coming down to something that is um, more of a compromise. And I mean, I have to say, like in like Todd Morton five thirteen and also Heartland, I do consider like yes, I'm the primary composer or I have the the vision, but there are so many other people involved that I th that I think yes, Marcus is the composer, but there are people who made it fun and possible who, who, who gave some money to make it come possible you, you you guys you and your brother were interested in just just you know doing the thing this whole thing with me and and I think uh, like Gabriel who, who did the engraving for me um, he's kind of a big part of, of the process for me like even though he he never kind of uh, had really the last word on any decisions but but he's just in that moment he's also just like a, not just like but he's like an important tool in the process uh, to to make something uh, come alive just like the musicians in the end or or uh, DX skills as a recording engineer and so it's just uh, yeah collaboration for me is always is always always important but sometimes I just want to want to make sure that I com stay completely true to my vision slash opinion um, slash taste. So, yeah. How do you see the relationship between writing the music, recording the music, and playing it live? Um, what happens to the music if you play it live, or what happens to music that's basically been played live and then recorded? Yeah, I think. Um, In, in a way, you kind of create the, the, the decision to, to have Heartland to be primarily a recording project, really, after the composition. It's, it was an intentional choice, um, because I think that by, by making a recording, you kind of create, you, you create a reference. You create something that people can actually listen to versus just read, read the score, like we were saying before. And it's, it's an important... It's, it's an important, uh, you could say, like, charge or battery in the, in the piece. You know, just having, having something that people can listen to before they play the piece will obviously influence greatly how they're going to uh, interpret it. And that's, that's why, like, my friend Nick Berch, he, was, uh, he, he used this word like a reference recording. And I, I don't... I, I, I cannot say that I really know what he meant by that, but it kind of opened my, um, my eyes to this idea that it's important to have 
a recording that represents the piece in such a way that the composer's vision is realized. And I think that quite a few contemporary composers don't really have that um, possibility and that's why I'm really grateful to have worked with you guys. So that um, this piece exists now and it's kind of, it's, it's really, um, I can stand behind the performance and the recording and I can say, yeah, this is the piece. So if some if if some str uh, string quartet wants to perform it, they should definitely definitely listen to the reference recording. Uh. Time is a variable, very rarely discussed in the context of composition. It's usually other factors, which like harmony, melody, yeah. um, timbre. Um, time is also, of course, an important um, part of composition. How do you um, see that role of time? For your work <clears throat> yeah it's it's very important and you know since since i started working with uh, songwriters which was in the early 2000s um, i realized that um, for a lot of for a lot of people the songwriting aspect is very much about like saying what you need to say in um, the least amount of time really and i i think that's a it's a it's a great concept in a way and I learned a lot by approaching things that way as well but for my very own personal work I think the time uh, aspect is very important also to elicit certain certain emotions so that's like if something gets like maybe a little bit too repetitive it can be it, it can give people a certain emotion yeah and so that's something that I that I actually um, am very happy to um, use, yeah. And 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 I have to be careful not to edit myself too much. And this was really actually the, like the only thing that I really said to myself before actually writing uh, Heartland um, was that I wanted to edit less. And um, that's how it turned out. So like all the all the pieces. Um, are just as long as they need to be and just as long as the material suggested they need to be and, and I didn't make a decision decision when the piece uh, ends you know it's nothing has been ended prematurely um, everything is kind of in the initial idea in the initial cell and um, yeah I mean I, I had this realization a, a long time ago that repetition um, and, and the aspect of time plays a big role, not just not just for uh, not just rhythmically, uh, and not just for the form of a piece of music, but also harmonically. And this is something that people are not aware of, that if you kind of hear something long enough, or I mean, we know like something that initially is, sounds kind of grating, maybe, if you just get used to it, it, it starts you know sounding normal. And then just imagine like you have something you allow the time for the listener. You, you give the listener the time to actually go from oh this is grating to oh this is beautiful and then you add the next layer on top so 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 rather than 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 um, than kind of presenting too much at the same time you can just kind of in a way educate the listener uh, by taking into account um, you know the 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 temporal form, let's say. Well, I was also thinking, like in the piece, like Toad Morden 513, um, like many pieces which are from the Romantic period where the harmonic progression and melodic development leads the piece, um, sort of speeds time up. And other pieces then slow it down, where the, like, the moving the tempo goes down. But, but like a piece of 513, you have because you cannot predict the next chord, time dissolves in a way, because there's no expectation. It's still in a story, there's a sort of storyline, but <clears throat> it doesn't have this, this typical narrative where you know this, or where, you ex where you think this could be the next step. It's sort of after you've been continually wrong about which next chord is going to be next, time sort of disappears, which is also a very strong yeah, that, statement, isn't it? Yeah, and, and that's interesting because like, especially with a piece like Toad Modern 513, it's like, the chord, the, the chord, and the, the changes completely, like drastically, every seven and a half seconds or something. 
So, so I think it's it's actually the it's 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 the evenness of of that subdivision, basically, of that subdivision of time, which then then kind of leads to a different um, a subjective experience of the time that has passed or the time that will pass. This is the uh, effect I had when I listened uh, to the original um, version of Modern 513, which um, always, for me as the composer, felt as much too long. You know, so, so it took me a long time to understand where I was in the piece. Okay, so like, I was maybe I was 20 minutes in, I was thinking, okay, no, it will, it will stop in five minutes. No, 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 I just gotta go for another 40 minutes. And it's, it's, really, um, it's really interesting. And it's such a highly complex piece of music that even me as the one who's created it, I'm, I'm still, I, I still don't know everything that's in it. And I don't think I ever will. I think it was actually also Morten Feldman who had this um, challenge for himself as a composer to make you forget the chord that has just been played. So when you hear a chord and you forget what has just come before, that was actually something positive because um, you're actually in the moment as you hear it. I totally agree. Yeah, yeah. I had no idea that he, he said that. How do you see the relationship between the sound aspect of music and the composition aspect? This is, of course, probably more prominent theme nowadays because we can basically make music out of a single sound, mm -hmm. um, especially in the electronic realm. But it's quite interesting to hear it from you after you've worked in both parts, like the, the, the classical work where you've worked with an orchestra which has a limited, in a way a limited set of sound, and then um, in the realm of electronic music where it's extremely expensive. I, I, f I find that, that electronic music is, uh, is much, um, is much smaller range of, mm. of possibilities really. Um, but anyway, it's, it's really, it becomes like sound and composition I don't, I don't, I, I mean, in a way, it's something like if you really sit down and write a piece of music, uh, you, that just means you don't, you, you don't hear it right away. And even if you work with computer software to kind of recreate the sound of strings or whatever, uh, you, it's just not the same thing as if other people are play it, playing it. So, so in a way, there's always like the abstract and there's the concrete sound. And in a way, the composition is the abstract sound and the, the, the performed the performed music is the is the concrete sound uh, I don't know so really it's just just two things that that um, in, in a way in a way the, the performance or the actual the actual um, texture that is that is created by a performance with acoustic instruments or electronic instruments that is just the, the it, that's just the next step. So there's there's always some sort of um, um, decision, like like even if if you're if you are if you're an improviser, you're kind of making a decision to execute a certain action, just to play that note or to to hit the body of your guitar with the right hand or whatever. There's there's some sort of and that's the composition. So the composition is like the decision, and then. Um, the result of that action is the sound. And that's, that's kind of how it is, I think. Our sense of hearing shares intriguing connections to other senses. Um, from your experience, are there, what are the most interesting overlaps between these different senses? Does it, make, does it play a role for your music, for example? Between cinema, literature and music? Um, so you mean me media, media or media? I was also thinking about so how, how, for example, sound is vibration, mm -hmm. um, which is a tactile, I believe, it's like a, um, a feeling yeah. and sense of um, like something like physical, like phys physical reaction in your eardrums actually really vibrating, um, or how some people would actually see certain shapes or maybe colors when they're listening to music. Yeah. Um, I mean, I have to. I have to say, for me, that's that's just something that really is um, it's always a difficult question. I 
I wouldn't even say that music is, is necessarily something I hear in the first place. It's more of this, um, it's, it's, I, I call it, it's, it's more a sensation of, um, yeah, it's a feeling. There, there's no other word for that. Like some sort of uh, kinesthetic um, experience can also, I guess, be in, you know, combined with an intellectual um, sort of brainy, digital kind of idea, conceptual. Because um, really, if you, if, you think, if you think about it, that's, that's kind of the beauty um, of art, where really the, just the, the actual, physical world and us being in this physical world kind of represented as like with by the interfaces by the um, by our senses by the five senses that we know of and um, and but behind behind that in the person we have the we have the conceptual aspect of what we like who we are what we choose to do or what we believe, what we choose, we do, and and so like for me, this it's it's not, in and I mean I I had, I do have like some uh, synthetic things where I believe that is like a C, like a C chord or just the C is like more yellow or you know D is blue and like, I don't know I have these kind of experiences as well, but but it doesn't really it doesn't really matter for me musically. You say music is a feeling. When you listen to natural sounds like the ocean, does that give you this similar feeling as well, or is it restricted to? Um, no, it, it does. It does give me a feeling as well, but it's not. It's and I have to say this is again. It's not what I'm kind of interested in in creating myself. I think like any, anything that's like natural, anything that's already there, is there, and I just take it as I take it as granted, of course. But I also. Uh, it's it's just something that is just so so much I feel like one with that already so what I'm what I'm what I'm personally interested in is is like the extra the extra human or the extra experiential or the extra extra natural um, creation yeah so I mean that and that's that's also why I mean, I, I do understand that some other people, they kind of, they, they maybe also want to be one with everything or one with nature by their actions. So by, you know, composing something or by playing a music, especially by playing a musical instrument, and you kind of get the sense that you become one with everything. And for me, it feels like I have that all the time. Anyway, and I just want to kind of like see, okay, what's beyond, what's beyond the things that I would not normally do, or, um, I mean, why would like somebody who's who's like a, a sprinter, um, want to run at 100 meters in like 12 seconds, let's say, and then decides wants to run it under 10 seconds? It's kind of like a similar kind of it's, it, in a way, like sport is kind of maybe not the best um, comparison for that because like I don't I don't don't think um, you could you could kind of like quantify really what I'm doing but um, but there's this idea to kind of go beyond what is what is natural. Mm, that's very interesting. Yeah. Maybe as a closing um, thing, maybe you can give just top from the top of your head two pieces of art, it could be music, it could be a book, it could be a movie you've seen, um, that you would recommend to, to the viewers? Anything that caught your attention or still catches your attention? Um, yeah, I mean, like Francis Bacon's paintings, mm. um, like the, the paintings of the, of the Pope, for example. And I don't know, like, I guess they're just called Pope 1, 2, 3 or something. I don't know exactly. But those are just incredible. 
and I don't even want to say anything else about those. Like if you haven't seen those, it's uh, it's important. Very to... interesting personality as well, of course. Yeah, and I don't know much. I don't know much about him at all. It's just that this his art, his just the the. Um, I don't even want to call it expression. It's not a good word. Um, but it's just so powerful and and twisted and again maybe even represents what i just said like he's showing something that's not natural yeah. um so it's kind of like a twisted a twisted version of the reality and um so that's where I, maybe i can see like some similarities to what i'm doing um yeah other than that it's it's a really um it's a really interesting question i i i don't you know, I'm a, I'm a total nerd and um, German word Fachidiot, so I don't know much about others, other things other than what I do. Um, but like the um, performance and action art uh, in the US in the, in the 60s, 50s and 60s, 70s, that's something that has fascinated me quite a bit. and. Um, really here also I don't have I don't have any names um, available to say but I think it's like worth worth diving into that like, in, like obviously boys it's German but um, like the, the idea and I don't know I don't remember his name right now this guy that uh, as a performance piece um, had himself shot in the arm um, amazing stuff like powerful really really powerful this kind of idea like go to go beyond um, I, and I think like in a way like I do believe music is kind of the strongest one of the strongest uh, mediums um, but performance art I think is like even is maybe the ultimate art form and um, my ex-wife was is a performance artist and it was really a great time um, you know learning about how one can elicit emotions and thoughts and by by just and and again it's a conceptual thing it's something like you you, you first have the, you first make the composition and then you perform it and it's um, yeah that was my answer great many thanks <laughs> thank you